Measure Y Oversight Committee. Sure. We have a quorum, so you feel free to start when you're ready. Great. Okay, well, I will call our meeting to order. Uh, and I would uh, like to ask for a roll call. Casillas? Here. Uh, Dana? Fuentes? Fulgoni? Here. Gonzalez? I think I saw his screen up here somewhere. Um, Strum? Here. Olson? Here. Ragsack? Here. There she is. <laughs> Snodgrass? Here. There we are. Boivita? Here. And McCosey. And we have a quorum. Very good. Uh, at this point of the meeting, we'll uh, open for any oral communications or presentations from the public. If any of the member of the public wishes to speak, please click on the raise hand option on your screen. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't see any members of the public on the call at this time. Very good, there being none, then we'll uh, move into the consent agenda. Everybody uh, got a copy of the minutes of our May 19th, 2021 meeting, assuming we've all had a chance to uh, review. Uh, and if that is the case, I would ask for a motion to approve those minutes. I'll second. A second. I'll second. Very good. We have a motion. It's been seconded. Any discussion on the minutes? There being none, do we need a roll call for that or can we do it by show of hands? Uh, it's uh, because we're doing Zoom, uh, my preference would be to do a roll call and that way Very the good. public can also uh, see. Uh, Casillas? Dana? Yes. Fuentes? Fulgoni? Yes. Gonzalez? Aye. Strum? Yes. Olson? Yes. Ragsack? Yes. Snodgrass? Yes. Wivita? Yes. And McCosey? Aye. The motion carries. Very good. Uh, we'll also need a motion to uh, directing and authorizing staff to prepare and publish the seventh annual report containing the information presented to the Revenue Measure Committee oversight at this meeting on February 9th, 2022. So moved. Can I get a second? Aye. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion or questions? There being none, I'll ask for a roll call. Casillas? Dana? Yes. Fulgoni? Yes. Gonzalez? Yes. Strum? Yes. Olson? Yes. Ragsack? Yes. Snodgrass? Yes. Boivita? Yes. And McCosey? Yes. The motion carries. And I don't believe we've had any items removed from the consent agenda. So we'll move uh, into new business. And uh, the first uh, item we're gonna wanna work on today is we'll, uh, the election of a new chair and vice chair as the present chair and vice chair's terms are expiring. So that be the case, uh, I would like to uh, ask if there is a, we can get a motion uh, to nominate uh, our new chair. I'd like to make a motion that we nominate a new chair. Great, and I'll second that. Who, who would you like to nominate, Mr. Shrub? Oh, I have to name somebody now? 
putting me on the spot. I'm the new guy. I've been here six minutes. Um, I was just trying to move the meeting along. Sure. Uh, let me explain the process. In this case, we're um, we're asking for nominations of uh, of members to become chair. So, if you would like to nominate someone, then you would make a motion to um, appoint someone chair moving forward. Got it. I'll abstain at this point. Thank you, Erwin. Can can excuse me? Can we start with uh, just a question? Maybe we can ask if there's any so-called volunteers. Anybody would be interested, Rad. Hate to put somebody on the spot. Do we have any uh, motivated folks here? Well, Rick, you, you, me, and uh, PJ have, all, have already done our chairmanship, so I think we right. have to share the wealth. <laughs> um, I'm not looking for more responsibilities, but I'd be willing to do it if if it would help the the body. Thank you. Thank you. So moved. <laughs> okay, we have a motion to uh, a nomination for Robbie Olson to be chair. It would be more exciting if somebody else got nominated too. Then you could vote me down. <laughs> so there's an opportunity. Uh, can I get a second? Is there a second for that nomination? I I'll second the nomination. Very good. <laughs> Do we have any other nominations for chair? Democracy at its best. <laughs> Uh, there being none, then I, I think we'll take a roll call for the vote. Casillas? Yes. Dana? Yes. Bugoni? Yes. Gonzalez? Yes. Strum? Yes. Olson? Yes. Ragsack? Yes. Snodgrass? Yes. Wibita? Yes. And McCosey. Yes. Great. The motion carries. Congra congratulations, Robbie. We're glad to have you as our new chair. Uh, and you. I think since I'm no longer the chair, that uh, you can step in and take it here as we're going to need a new vice chair. Okay. Hit the ground running. Um, so, uh, Erwin, please feel free to jump in and correct me when I get our uh, process wrong. I've been in enough situations that all do Robert's rules differently. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure I'll have a, a wrong presumption at some point. But um, thank you all. This is uh, an honor. And now I'd like to take nominations for a new vice chair. And being the vice chair last year, I can tell you that it was a lot like being on the committee. Unless I can't be there and then you'd be chair. Uh, like last time, do we have any volunteers? Okay, well, then I guess we get to start putting people on the spot. I I'd like, to, I'd like to nominate Noriko Ragsack. I'll second that. Okay, and then Noriko, would you be willing to accept that nomination? Yes, I would. Thank you, PJ. Thank you. I was going to raise my hand, but I got a little shy. <laughs> Perfect. It's better um, this way. <laughs> so at this point, Erin, do we take other nominations or do we move uh, to a if, motion? If the committee would like to nominate someone else, we could take the nomination. We would initially take the vote on the first uh, nomination. If that one carries, then the second one would be moot. Mo but it, otherwise, we could take a vote on the second one if the first one didn't carry. OK. Uh, do we have any second nominations? Hearing none, let's uh, go ahead and take a vote um, to vote Noriko in as vice chair. Great. Yes. Yes. Dana. Yes. Bugoni. Yes. Gonzalez. Yes. Strum. Yes. Olson. Yes. Ragsack. Yes. Snodgrass. Snodgrass? Oh, it looks like he froze. He looks like he froze. Yeah. Voivoda? Yes. And Mikozy? Yes. OK, the motion carries. Congratulations, Norigo. Yes, congratulations. All right, welcome to the team.
<laughs> okay, so uh, that's all of our officers that we need to elect. So let's move on to 5B, which is our financial status report for fiscal year 2020-2021, a mid-year financial status report for fiscal year 21-22, and an audit report. So we'll pass that on to staff. Hi, um, I'm Marissa Duran. I'm the Assistant Finance Director and I'll be presenting that to you today. So um, today we'll be presenting our audited final numbers for fiscal year 2021 and also our mid-year projections for our current fiscal year 21-22. This is the first audit that effectively is auditing the new measure Y, where there is now funding allocated to the Parks Division. Specifically, we have 54% going to police 38 to fire and 8% is funding for uh, parks activities. So let me share my screen and I'll share my presentation. Can you see my screen? Because this is the awkward part where I can't see what you're seeing. Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you, Nurika. Thank you. Okay, so um, this, this slide effectively represents our fiscal year 2021 audited final numbers. So operationally, police and fire were pretty much on budget. However, fire did have a slightly over budget due to overtime. Vehicle maintenance and gas for police cost a little bit of overages, but parks was not able to spend all of their uh, allocation due to some COVID restrictions that they had at the beginning of the fiscal year. Marissa? Uh -huh. Can I jump in and ask, is there a way to make this a bit larger? Oh, actually, or do we have it in print as well? I think we have this in print as well. Did that work? Oh, that is much better, yes. Thank okay, you. sorry about that. Okay. So in terms of capital, FIRE did not make a lot of progress on their station repairs, but has carried the monies forward into the current fiscal year and are hoping to complete those repairs in time for this fiscal year. Likewise, police also had some, uh, some capital that they were not able to purchase and have also carried the monies forward to complete the purchases this year. As you can see, revenues outperformed projections as we had anticipated a large decrease due to the, due to the budget being prepared during the early stages of COVID. However, we were able to realize a 16% increase in revenues, so we did um, outpace what we thought we would, where we would be at the end of the fiscal year. This can, slide, you, can you explain that? I mean, it's, it's $1.8 million dollars better, than, uh, better than you budgeted. Yes, yeah, so at the, at the beginning, the budget is prepared in the April month or so. And so this, this budget was prepared in April 2020. That was the beginning of COVID. Everything was closed down. We, we uh, tried to be very conservative with our numbers. Our um, HDL, which we hired for tax projection, was projecting huge decreases. So we, we, we basically budgeted very conservative, conservatively. We didn't wanna go over budget on any, of the, um, on any of our projections. So that's what happened. But it, I don't know if you've been hearing some of the presentations that Cindy's been doing at council, but what we saw really, really early stages is that we were benefiting from the pool a lot, which cities like Santa Cruz and Monterey that rely a lot on tourists were not, but um, we were because our sales tax was strong because people still had to shop, people still had to go to Target. All of our, the way our sales tax works is we don't have like a lot of retail and a lot of heavy dollar items. So our state's strong and we benefited from the pools a lot. And that's why we're seeing this, these numbers come up the way they are. Okay, great. Just uh, just wanted to get some color. To see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this slide represents our current fiscal year. Yeah. And we're also expecting a, another increase, an 8.8%. All the categories of sales tax have fully recovered and are exceeding our pre-pandemic levels. This budget was also a little conservative, so that's why you're seeing also that increase. Operationally wise, police is, is expected to have savings due to some vacant positions. Fire will be, will be over again due to overtime. Parks had a slow start as they had some vacancies they needed to fill, but is completely expecting to spend all of their budget by the end of the fiscal year. Um, in terms of capital, FIRE has requested new appropriations to buy breathing apparatus. That'll be in the amount of about 280,000. And police has also made a request for more money towards a temperature control system for the station. All departments are expected to exceed their 10% requirement at the end of the fiscal year. 
This slide shows our sales tax of 2021 in comparison to 2020 in the different categories. And as you can see, this current year is exceeding last fiscal year in almost all, all categories. And this, this tax is a uh, transactional tax or a destination-based tax. And in, uh, it differentiates from our Bradley Burns tax as this is based on where, where your car gets registered instead of where you buy it. So this does see higher, higher uh, dollars because of that. And this, this slide shows us our maintenance of effort and we have, not, we have exceeded it for both police and fire. In the with the passage of Measure Y, we're now we now have to increase that MOE by the CPI every year, but we still are very much exceeding it. And that concludes our presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions from the committee? Thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you very much, Marissa. We appreciate your report thank and your time. You. Okay. Uh, now we have an opportunity for public input. Is there anyone on the line, Erwin? We don't have anyone from the public now. All right, well then we'll keep it moving. Uh, committee, do we have any discussion we would like to offer um, in response to the presentation? I'm just going to assume that some of the some of the growth is going to be inflation related. Prices are up, particularly autos, things like that, that are a big part of the revenue stream. Um, the inflationary, uh, you know, paradigm here is going to will be chasing it. Prices or costs are going to be going up along with the revenue that's it, that being increased. You know, PGA, look what's happening with fuel. So uh, uh, maybe maybe they should cut us back at the pump. <laughs> they could start anywhere. I'll be happy to participate. <laughs> All right. Do we have any other discussion uh, about the presentation? Okay. Hearing none, uh, we would accept a motion uh, to accept the financial reports and the fiscal year twenty. 2020 and 2021, the audit report prepared by Mays and Associates and finding uh, and finding that all expenditures were made as promised to Watsonville residents pursuant to Watsonville Municipal Code subsection 3-6.110B. Do we have that motion? You don't have to recite it. So moved. <laughs> Thank you. And a second? I second. All right. Thank you, Noriko. Uh, do we have any discussion on the motion before we vote? Mr. Hearing Chair, none? may I clarify if uh, the motion was to do both of the oh. staff recommendations or if uh, did you want to take uh, each item separately? I read all of 5B number five. Um, I'm happy to take it together, but if you'd prefer we split it, that's okay with me. Uh, we can do both together if, if that's okay with the committee. Does anyone on the committee like to split it into two votes? Well, since I made the motion, I'm I'm, I'm willing to do it bo uh, both combined. Oh yes, thank you. All right, let's roll on if that works for you, Erwin. Great, thank you. To see yes. Yes. Dana. Yes. Quintus. Fulgoni. Yes. Gonzalez. Yes. Strum. Yes. Olson? Yes. Ragsack? Yes. Snodgrass? Yes. Boyboda? Yes. And Mikosi? Yes. The motion carries. Great. Thank you. And then we have one more motion uh, before we move on to our next staff report. Uh, this is we need a motion to accept the uh, mid-year financial status report for fiscal year 2021 and 2022. Um, just a point of clarification. I believe that the, the two motions were uh, part of the initial motion. Oh. For 5B, uh, 5 and 6, is that correct? Well, I read all of 5B5 when uh, Steve made that motion, but I did not read 6. Okay. So maybe I misunderstood. 
We we can do a motion on the on on six if if, if that's let's perfect. let's go ahead and have another one just in case since I didn't read it the first time. Of course, we were confused on which was red. Sure. Cross all the T's, dot the I. So we need we need that motion from someone for five B and then number six about the mid year review. I make I'll motion. Approve the mid year report. Thank you. And do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, if there's no discussion on that. Let's move on to the vote. Casillas? Yes. Dana? Yes. Fulgoni? Yes. Gonzalez? Yes. Strum? Yes. Olson? Yes. Ragsack? Yes. Snodgrass? Yes. Boivada? Yes. And McCosey? Yes. The motion carries. Great, thank you. And thank you again, Marissa, for your presentation. All right, we'll keep moving on to 5C, which is staffing and operations report from Watsonville Fire Department from January 1 through December 31st, 2021. We'll pass that on to staff. Well, good evening. Good evening. Welcome, Rudy. Uh, uh, Fire Chief Rudy Lopez here. I should say Chief Lopez. Sorry about that. Fine, Robbie, and uh, congratulations to you. It's, uh, been chosen as or volunteering as uh, chair, and also uh, uh, who was I'm sorry, who was the uh, vice? Was it uh, Nariko? Yeah, Nariko Ragsack. Yes. Very pleased to be here this evening. Um, I know that we have two more presentations following mine, so I will get right to it. And I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. And that's let's see here. It's not what I wanted. Here we go. Now, please bear, bear with me here. That's not it. It looks like it's the far right tab. Yeah, it's hidden underneath this, uh, your sharing screen. Let's see if I can squeeze under that. There it is. All right, you got it? Yes, we can see it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Rosa. <laughs> All right, as the uh, chairperson said, uh, this uh, report is uh, from January to December, 2021. And we'll start out with staffing. Um, uh, for last year, we had seven members under the measure uh, of those seven members, six were firefighters and one administrative uh, staff person. Uh, last March, we made our third payment of $286,306 uh, to pay for our ladder truck. Uh, we have two additional annual payments remaining. We'll be happy when the, those two payments are made. Uh, we paid $9,902 on vehicle maintenance last year. We also paid $39,771 on firefighter supplies that included uh, firefighter personal protective equipment repairs, uh, met emergency medical supplies, hose testing, fire uh, academy gear, uh, firefighter background investigations, health screening, and psychological exams. We also purchased the following uh, training supplies, uh, three iPads, four computer-aided dispatch devices, a laptop for our academy instructor, and a camera for training total, totaling $12,849. So our wildland uh, fire engine was very busy last year, uh, battling wild, wildland fires throughout the state. In all, we responded to five mutual aid re uh, requests including the uh, Estrada fire, which is uh, right here in our backyard, down near uh, Mount Madonna. So last year we spent $61,862 on personal protective equipment maintenance and repair, uniforms for all of our members and personal protective equipment for two of our newest firefighters. As mentioned uh, during the, uh, the financial report, uh, 
we we did uh, a plan to uh, invest in, in our capital. There was some major repairs that needed to be done, and and I'm, I'm really glad, um, happy to share that. Uh, as you can see through the pictures, we were able to uh, repair the concrete uh, at our station number one, which, which was in dire need of repairs. The before and after pictures, of course. And here you can see the asphalt repairs that were done as well. Uh, cost for both concrete and asphalt uh, total forty one thousand three hundred twenty five dollars. And and no, that's not a that's not a pond that you see on the left. Um, and uh, fortunately, we, we were able to make those repairs. We also had roof repairs to our station one. Uh, prior to the repairs, uh, we had water leaks that were going into the walls um, at our station one. Our roof repairs for station one was $47,961. And an additional 5,000 was spent on the repairs of that roof uh, due to termites uh, that were uncovered during the roof repairs. At our station two, we also had some concrete and asphalt repairs and the station two repairs total 127,524. It was a substantial amount of repairs that were needed. Uh, we also had repairs to our station one, excuse me, station two roof in the amount of 24,144. And um, you know, you can't really you tell the, the repairs, but they, um, they were done and much appreciated by our crews. So last summer, uh, we were very fortunate to be able to put on two summer youth academies. Uh, those academies uh, targeted young men and women of our community, ages 14 to 18. Each academy had uh, 20 local youth participate. Uh, we provided the youth academy members with meals, uniforms, and supplies. And of course, we provide them excellent training and mentorship and at no cost to, to the participants. Uh, here's, here's a picture of our second academy. So, so two separate academies. We took a three week uh, break in between to recharge our batteries, but it was in all, it was a, a great experience. I know for the youth, uh, for us as well, as we continue to do our part in reaching out to uh, our young men of Watsonville and the greater Pajaro Valley. And I must say that from these uh, participants, we recruited many of them into our fire cadet program. So we went from about seven cadets in, to now we have over 20, somewhere around 23. We're really proud to share that. So last year, so community risk analysis, um, last year we contracted with uh, Fitch and Associates uh, to conduct a community risk assessment that is, the cost of the contract was uh, not to exceed $49,995. Uh, Fitch and Associates began that assessment back in August uh, and looks to be done this month and should be ready to, we should be ready in time to present to a city council on the March 8th uh, meeting. So some project, projects that are currently in progress, uh, painting and sealing of station one is a priority due to water um, getting into the walls. And it can be seen uh, in the interior of the picture up top right, um, uh, resulting in cracking um, and potentially creating some, some health uh, issues. Uh, we anticipate getting that work done this year. Other upcoming projects. So last year we had, and actually the year before, late uh, in 2020, we had um, a plan to put on CPR uh, classes for Spanish speaking uh, community members and also fire sa uh, seniors fire safety classes as well. Uh, but due to uh, COVID-19 uh, restrictions, uh, the, the Spanish CPR classes and Fire, the fire uh, senior fire safety classes, classes uh, we could not move forward with them. However, we do plan as uh, some of these restrictions begin to be lifted, 
on on moving forward with that hopefully in the fall. Uh, we also are planning on changing up our recruitment process. As, as you may you may be aware that we had a, an issue or a challenge of retaining uh, firefighters for a while there. We lost quite a few. Uh, in fact, uh, I think 12 in, in a 14 month or 15 month period. Uh, so we have been able to hire, uh, incrementally hire uh, firefighters with an emphasis on hiring local uh, firefighters from Watson of the Greater Power Valley. This paramedic training program for EMTs is, is a way of, for us to widen that pool. And, and because of this economics being what they are in Watsonville, it is very expensive for young men and women to put themselves through paramedic school. Our hope is that we can hire young men and women locally, put them through an academy and sponsor them through paramedic school. That's gonna give us the best chance of retaining people. And it's also gonna, uh, it's gonna bold well for us in terms of people being rooted in Watsonville and the greater Pajaro Valley. And that concludes my presentation. I am more than happy to answer any questions you may have for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chief Lopez. Um, let me start by saying uh, it's exciting to hear about uh, 40 youth Chief involved. Chief Lopez. A... Yes, sir. Oh. I was going to say, uh, so anyhow, Chief Lopez, it's, it's exciting to hear about 40 sure. youth academy participants, the uh, boy, almost tripling, it looks like, of cadets. Uh, right. And then that emphasis on hiring local folks. I think those are um, really strong efforts that, that we're, we'd love to see. Thank you. Are there, are there you. any other uh, comments or questions from the committee? Yeah, Robbie, I, I, I just had a comment for the chief. Uh, uh, I, I see you made uh, three payments on that truck. And are you paying interest on that loan or uh, is that interest free? Because you might want to consider, since you're flush with cash, paying off that loan entirely now. Yeah, it's uh, it's tied into the contract. It's uh, low interest uh, payments. There were some very, very, very attractive uh, uh, loans for fire apparatus that are out there and still out there. Um, it, it it gives us a, an opportunity to um, to spend some of our our, our uh, revenues in in other places. But yeah, it definitely, want, is that interest fixed? It is. Excellent. Okay. You might want to have finance look at it, though. It might sure. make sense to pay it off. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, Chief, this is PJ. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, toward the end of your presentation, I inferred that maybe you're seeing a little more attrition than either you've been used to, or, um, and I don't know whether that's, if you can pinpoint what that is you may have some retire some of that may be retirement I don't know but if you wouldn't mind just uh, expanding on that a little bit sure uh, when we lost uh, quite a few members uh, many of those members that we lost didn't uh, it, it wasn't through retirement it was just moving to other departments and um, when I came in here I, I came in here committed uh, with along with my uh, command staff in reversing that and changing that and I, I really believe a, a big part of that is, the, is culture, is a culture shift that needs to take place. And we, we put a huge emphasis on, on, again, on hiring local people for one. And we've been very fortunate that of the last seven to eight that we've hired, most of them have ties to Watsonville, right? And there's something to be said about that. And, and I really believe that the future of the Watsonville Fire Department is in hiring local people, people who have uh, complete buy-in to this community. And so that's part of the equation. The other part of it was, um, you know, they're leaving for higher wages elsewhere. And uh, I know that the city has negotiated uh, the last contract and and provided uh, our members uh, uh, a good contract, I believe to be a good contract that helps with that, re that retention challenge that, that may exist. Thank you. Sure. I had a quick question for you, Chief. This is sure. with Anna. When that report comes in on our risk assessment, I know you've been waiting that for, for quite a while. What do you think, just on a, your experience, you've been doing this uh, for quite some time, what do you think is going to be the focus of that assessment? Where do you think your future, if we had to make some changes or strengthen things, where would it be, do you think? 
Well, I know for one that that we provide an extremely high level of service in this this uh, this community. This department does, and and that's a result of highly uh, trained individuals. We have a second and uh, academy, a regional academy that's actually takes place here at our Station Two uh, training facility, um, and we can we have continued training that's that's excellent. Um, we have state of the art equipment for sure, and now. The analysis is going to identify some factual information of, you know, how well we do, and and in lot some of it has to do with response times, and you know that's that is something that I think uh, our our um, uh, council, uh, the community would have to weigh heavily and 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 to determine what is the standard that they expect, um, and I'm always for for increasing. You know, our level of service and providing a greater service to our community. And I'm, I'm from Watsonville, I'm raised in Watsonville. The only thing I can't say, I wasn't born here, but I came here at eight months old. So I, I can pretty much say I'm, I'm all Watsonville. So hope that it answers your question, sir. It, it does. Okay. I, I was just thinking, it seems like our response times are good and seems like uh, these measures have increased our equipment deficiencies. So I was just wondering, just where we think we may need do we need a third station do we need more equipment i'm i'm that's the assessment that, that i'm kind of thinking where are they going to go with that because i'm sure most of what we're doing is fine i'm sure right. the assessment is where are we going to go in the future and what our right. need might be right? sure and, and and to be real, quite honest with you it's it comes down to you know what what's what's the standard we're looking for gotcha and, and what's the cost associated with that standard gotcha I have a question, uh, Chief Lopez. This is Adrian Gonzalez here. Going back to the truck of yours, uh, you still got two large payments happening. Is sure. there something after uh, a large something you're looking for after those payments are made? You're going to have a, a lot of money back in, in your coffers there once that's done. Do you have something are you anticipating you're looking at a purchasing uh, yep. after you're done with the truck payment? Yeah, those are, those are some really, you guys have, I mean, offer some really good questions, and that's a really good question. Um, uh, yes, we do. In fact, you know, our, our, one of our biggest focus right now is to, is to get our facilities where they need to be uh, without question. You know, we're, we're benefiting from a, from a measure that's, that's providing us the resources to be able to catch up, so to speak, and, and not no longer kick that can down, down, you know, down the road. And so I'm committed to making the improvements that we need to make to bring us into the 21st century uh, right. firefighting, for one. And we are currently working on an apparatus replacement plan where we can uh, generally identify at what point, at what age, at, with X amount of miles, X amount of years of service, can are we should we be replacing an apparatus? So we're not last minute, you know, having to order three units or two units, but that we can forecast far enough ahead that we would have a, a good plan in place that does not overburden um, our budget. Okay, thank you. I have one, one more question, if I may. Uh, going back to your repairs, you mentioned for the last couple of years you had extensive repairs and you guys are finally making them. Are you using local companies for those repairs? We are. Yeah, no, we, we definitely, that's you know, part of, part of uh, our responsibility, of course, and, and uh, we do uh, without question. Um, again, I'm a Watsonville guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm a believer in, in this community. I love Watsonville and the city. And, and uh, yeah, we, 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 everything we do, every decision we make is in the best interest of this department, the community, um, and the city. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any more comments or questions from the committee? Uh, hearing none, I will. Go over to Erwin, do we have any public input? We do have one. Great. Go ahead and allow them. Lowell, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to say to the committee, uh, my express my appreciation as a community member and uh, an elected of doing the right thing so well and so much of it and thinking of uh, all the needs in the community. And I think we were really lucky to, to be able to acquire these uh, resources and spend them wisely. And so I have to say uh, kudos to staff 
but also kudos to the committee for their stewardship. And, you know, of course, we couldn't have done it without the uh, public support. And so I just wanted to express my appreciation to the committee, particularly, and uh, all the staff members as well. Good, good job. Good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you all, or I should say Council, Council Member Hurst. Uh, do we have any more uh, public comment, Erwin? That is the only speaker at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay, great, thank you. Then let's go back to uh, the committee for any discussion we have on the presentation by Chief Lopez. Not hearing any more discussion. Uh, we'll jump on to uh, 5C number five. So we'll need a motion accepting staffing and operations report from the Watsonville Fire Department from January 1st through December 31st, 2021. I'll make a motion to accept. Thank you. And do we have a second? I'll second the motion. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, let's move to a roll call. See yes? Yes. Dana? Yes. Fulgoni? Yes. Gonzalez? Yes. Strum? Yes. Olson? Yes. Ragsack? Yes. Snodgrass? Yes. Boyfriend? Yes. Mikozi? Yes. The motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you again, Chief Lopez. Thank you. Thank you each one of you for uh, your commitment to serve in this capacity. We appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, we'll move now to 5D staffing and operations report from the Watsonville Police Department from January 1st through December 31st of 2021. And I'm guessing this is Chief Zamora's presentation. And uh, let me say congratulations um, on your recent pinning, Chief Zamora. We're grateful to have you uh, serving our community. Thank you, sir. And thank you everybody for being here this evening. Um, it is a pleasure to bring you this information. Um, let me do this. All right, tell me what you guys see, because we can see it. Do you see the large screen or do you see my notes? We see the presenter view. The presenter view, all right. Meaning we see your notes. Now you see my notes. Yes, yes we do. All right. Well, that's okay. You guys can see my notes. Um, I don't know how to remove that, so we'll work with it. So measure why uh, we're so blessed to have that. You know, b b before I get started with, with that, uh, kudos to Fire Chief Rudy uh, Lopez for taking on the culture change. That is a huge um, undertaking, and I know he's doing a good job over there. Um, so kudos to you, Rudy. I Nice work. So the uh, measure why, again, we're very blessed to, to have this uh, with us. The tax measure continues to help support our staffing levels and improve the efficiency of the police department. It currently funds 13 positions and I'll go through the positions um, one by one. And I won't go through too much detail, but just give you like a snapshot and you'll see it there on the notes. Uh, seven police officers. Are, are funded through this uh, measure. And police officers respond to calls for service from the community, but they do so much more. Um, it's just, we don't have enough time to capture all that, but um, I just wanted to point that out. And I think, you know, every, everybody here, I, I'm assuming knows that. And we have um, one police service specialist who responds to non-emergency calls for service, um, usually property crimes that have very little offender information or no offender information. They also help with traffic control or they help us find missing persons. The property and evidence technician, property and evidence here at the police department is very busy. You wouldn't know it just by seeing them, but they handle thousands of pieces of not just evidence, but property. And this property tech, what they're responsible for really is processing evidence, storing it, and then getting it ready for trial or for detectives or for the DA's office. Um, so they do a lot of work there. 
and the crime analyst provides uh, assistance with existing cases and collects and interprets data for us, which is very important. Our youth specialist uh, is assigned to our Caminos uh, program, and they really support the families and the youth that are going through that first time offender program. Um, the administrative analyst position um, will assist in enhancing the recommendations of the ad hoc committee and policing, uh, or the ad hoc, yeah, the, the, the ad hoc committee on policing and social equity. And what it does, it really just, um, there was several recommendations that came out of that committee and you'll see them on here and it's uh, develop and increase programs for youth and families, develop partnerships and collaboration and opportunities and community engagement all done in order to really strengthen our relationship and uh, trust with our community. Um, that position isn't filled yet, but we're hoping to get that filled probably by March, and, and end of March. Um, and then the records clerk position has remained vacant due to the department staffing uh, needs evaluation. I'm trying to get you guys to not see my notes here because it's starting to bug me. Uh, You might want to try control F. Control F. I think it also may be that you want to share a different screen than the one you're looking at. Let's see. So I think that would be in Zoom. Oh, there, there you go. go. Whatever it was, uh, good work. I'm so smart. <laughs> Not really, actually. That's what we were about to say. That was a total, uh, I, I don't know what I did, but it worked. Um, so training. Vehicles and equipment, I cannot stress how important this is to us. Um, everything from the, just everything that you see on here is, is critically important for us to be able to work in, at a very high uh, level. Measure Y pays for the basic police academy for officers. It pays for training for the uh, field training officers and people who teach the, the officers that are just coming out of the academy. Uh, we also send folks to the uh, field training officer updates there's critical response training, there's interview and interrogation courses, and the leadership courses, which is one of my favorites, because you'll see, you, you'll see the picture there of the officers uh, who went to the California Peace Officers Association leadership course. It's a very intense course that goes far beyond the fundamentals of leadership. It's not just about leading police officers anymore. It's about an exploration of the self and kind of self-discovery, because if you want to be a good leader, you have to really know who you are and and so that's very meaningful and I, and I know that it was meaningful for, for the officers who who, who um, attended vehicles we were able to purchase one motorcycle police motorcycle and two police cars uh bulletproof vests 13 of those that was huge for us our uh accurate is a information network that is uh fantastically impressive it really helps with uh, our investigations, our crime analyst actually uses it quite a bit. Um, you can put your name in there and there's, you'd be surprised how much information there, there is in there um, of people that, that we are looking at either investigating or, or even that we're looking to hire. So the, oh, and then the, uh, the desk officer reporting system, which is the DORS program. It's an online uh, reporting system where folks can, folks from our community or anybody really who um, well, really mainly for people in our community. Um, if you're a victim of a crime or a theft, usually it's theft or burglary, car burglaries and things of that nature, um, people can lo log in and uh, file their own report online. And that's been re really helpful. Usually we have about 500 reports a year and that's monitored by one of our uh, patrol supervisors. The care team. Um, this is a collaboration between uh, Watsonville Police Department and uh, County Mental Health, and it is a really, really good um, program. It's worked out very well for us, and what this is, is uh, coordinated efforts, compassionate efforts to offer uh, families and individuals who are experiencing uh, mental health needs and 
Measure Y pays $50,000 of this contract. And it's just been phenomenal for us. I mean, we're at the point now where other agencies from, you know, around the country are contacting us, uh, local agencies, Santa Clara, Hollister, uh, New York City, uh, different agencies in that area contacted our team because they're hoping to really just take our idea and make it their own, which is really good. Um, so let me show, I'm going to pop in this video real quick. You guys hear it? We mainly focus our services on people that are maybe going through a mental health crisis or just need to. Oh, let's try that again. We mainly focus our services on people that are maybe going through a mental health crisis or just need to support or information on mental health. We recognize that not every call to the service that we go to is necessarily going to be a crime or somebody that we will be arresting. A lot of times it's people that just need some extra help, extra support. Do you want to make sure you're going to be okay? Well, I respond along with the officers. And my role is to provide a good clinical knowledge for individuals that are struggling with mental health. Due to the pandemic, we've noticed an increase in calls, a lot of people struggling with mental health conditions. A lot of these individuals are experiencing, whether it be anxiety or depression, a lot of adjustment to a lot of the changes that we have experienced in the last year. Sometimes they don't have a coping mechanism and they go through a mental crisis. We can talk to them, we can guide them, but uh, sometimes they don't want to take the resources and they just have to understand. It might not be the right time for them, it might not be the right day but we can help them one other day. We also provide resources to my family members that are not familiar on how to help the individual. Resources such as food banks, clothing, Salvation Army, also programs that can provide medical assistance to individuals. It is very important knowing that we were able to help them and not by arresting them and making them feel like there's no other option other than going to jail. It's um, pretty good walking away knowing that we were able to help. So the uh, care team, uh, one last thing I'll say about that is that it's the only co-responder model in the county. And what that means is that we have dedicated officers to respond with our mental health clinician, Raina, who's just amazing, um, to help these folks. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's just for, for us, it's been really efficient. Um, so let's move on to uh, Caminos Hacia el Éxito program, uh, Pathways to Success. This is a very, um, some of you may have heard of it, um, but the, it's a derision program for first time offenders, juveniles. And the program provides um, sort of wraparound services, counseling, mentoring, leadership courses for these juveniles who are, um, who commit their first offense. And it really provides evidence-based uh, approaches to holding the youth accountable while at the same time bringing in the, the uh, family. And it's just really one of those things that um, has been very successful for us. Um, the, during COVID, like everybody else, we had to slow things down. It, things weren't really working, but then we went into the virtual mode and that started to work. Now we're back into uh, person to person um, uh, conversations and meetings with the youth and the families. Some of the other things that these youth receive are, whoops, are a paint day, which you see here is like an art day. Um, there is, hey, and I didn't, I didn't know about this one until recently. They have a financial literacy class. Uh, Bay Federal, one of their employees comes out and teaches them about financial li literacy, how to open an account, how to you know, save your money, how to not get scammed. Uh, when, when people call, how to write a check. And it, some people might think that it's a little antiquated to write a check nowadays, but it's actually not. Um, so they really learn a lot. They learn about building their resume um, and they do community service hours with nonprofit or organizations here locally. Um, so it really just provides a sense of responsibility and it just really helps them. You know, since 2002, 
we've had 516 youth that have participated in the program. 433 have successfully completed the program. And of all of those, 86% uh, of those youth have not reoffended. That says a lot about this program. Um, you know, we're very, we're very proud of the parents and youth who commit to participate in the program because they come to us by means of committing a crime, a misdemeanor. Um, but we still have to treat them with, with care and compassion it, it's, and see beyond that offense. And I think that's what makes the program special. It's what makes the, uh, um, the caseworkers in, involved in the program special because they really develop a, a tight, um, not a tight relationship, but they develop trust and that's where the magic happens. Um, the, um, you know, there's, there was this young female who was 15 years old and she was going to school, doing great, uh, good grades, great attendance, and she gets into a fight at school. So that's a misdemeanor. So that instead of that juvenile, instead of that incident of being referred to probation, it comes to us because it's a first offense. Well, through the process and in talking to our um, uh, caseworkers, they learned that she was being bullied at school, which is what triggered the fight. But then more so, they also learned that there was uh, things going on at home that nobody really knew about. And part of that was her dad was, uh, was ill and her mother was the sole contributor to the family um, her father ended up passing away during this process and the counseling and the relationships that, that she and, and our folks had I really got her through it. And she stayed in contact with us um, once she completed the, the program. She graduated uh, high school. The, not long ago, she contacted us and said she was at Cabrillo College and uh, pursuing her, her career. Um, so I think that's that's one of those things that are that's special, and you know, and that's just one story. Uh, there's so many others, and um, this work would not be as effective as it is if it wasn't for um, our, our 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 caseworkers. It, it's it's just they have an amazing talent. Um, Moving right along. Uh, so I had mentioned before the, the work done with the ad hoc committee uh, on policing and social equity. And what that was, was it was a group of diverse individuals uh, that got together and we talked about how can we improve uh, the service levels of police to community in Watsonville. But not just that, but it was also an opportunity to identify where there were the uh, gaps in, in, in social equity. So part of the process was to set up recommendations and the one that is connected to this particular slide is community engagement. So in an effort to support and enhance the recommendation, what we want, what we're doing is we're, we have the community, I'm sorry, we have the um, administrative analyst that's really gonna help us push this forward. Um, and outside of what we already have here at the police department, we're going to be expanding police and community engagement programs, uh, things that foster trust. Uh, there's going to be developed and coordinated efforts with community and nonprofits, the school district, uh, to really address crime issues and create opportunities to engage in, in meaningful dialogue that, that creates trust and that we get to know each other. Um, so again, that position will hopefully be filled this, this next month and upcoming projects. So the in-car camera project was just approved by city council and we have uh, some infrastructure, uh, things that we need to work on here. As you heard earlier, there's technology improvements that we need, that we're always looking at, um, drones, you know, that's what, one of those things that, that we've been looking at for a while and just uh, technology that will help our officers and professional staff do their job better. Uh, recruitment and hiring and vacant positions, we have to keep an eye on that all the time. And um, the renewal of the body-worn cameras, 
uh, contract is coming up in 2024. So we're wrapping up for that. And that's all I got. Any questions? Thank you, Chief. Uh, we appreciate your presentation. Do we have any questions from the committee? And you'll want to stop sharing your screen if you'd like. I'm trying to hear here. Well, there you know, we go. I'll there say, we go. I will say this: uh, it's exciting to hear about projects like the Care Team and Caminos and the uh, and the efforts to engage the community before people end up in the system. And that that focus is one that um, I think th those who know uh, really appreciate it. And I and I hope the engagement effort um, spreads the knowledge of that. So well done there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, part of this, you know, this whole effort um, is really to, I mean, we encounter people when they're at their worst, right? When the other larger system has failed them um, or family potentially has failed them. And that's when we encounter them. So really trying to um, fill those gaps so that that doesn't occur is very important to us. Definitely. Do we have any other questions? Have yes, Adrian. I have a question. Uh, first of all, congratulations, George, uh, on Thank your you. on your promotion there. Uh, going back to the crisis responder, um, how often is that one person? You only have one person, correct? Right. And how well, we have we that? have we have one clinician, and we have two officers that 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 go with the clinician. Yeah. How often does that person go out or does that group go out? Are they on call basis or are they kind of walking up and down Main now Street? Yeah, no, yeah, totally. They, they are um, full time. Um, Raina works Monday through Friday and our officers, they kind of split the week, um, but they respond to calls. They're, I mean, I was talking to a sergeant the other day, a patrol sergeant, and he was telling me that 80% of the calls that they go to now are either mental health, homeless, uh, addiction or any of those three combinations. So, and that's in the evening time. Um, you know, during during the day, um, you know, we are able to relieve a lot of that from the patrol officers during the day. I heard this morning that we're potentially getting another um, clinician to be paired with our other officers. So the week is going to be spread out more. We're going to be able to do um, or be able to respond to calls for service in the evening time. Sure. Will that thin out your department anymore because you have two sets of teams working with the, each clinician? What, what, what now? I'm sorry. Will, you, will that thin out your department anymore as far as staffing goes? Because no, no, it's it's no because we, we still have two uh, officers assigned to the care team. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just it would just split one instead of responding together to calls the three of them. Uh, you, you'd have two separate teams. Okay. Yeah. But you have two officers on each team, right? Right. Okay. No, so no, one, one, one officer on each team. One. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. That's exciting to hear that that program is growing. Uh, do we have other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, hearing none, um, we can move to public input if we have any. You do you have one, Mr. Chair? One second. Great, thank you. Lowell, mm -hmm. please go ahead. Uh, just, just again, thank you very much, uh, Chief Zamora and uh, Deputy Chief Sims and, and all your crew. Tremendous outreach to the community. We're, we're really lucky to have these resources and have them used so wisely. And so my kudos and congratulations and commendations to all those on the force and the great work that they do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Hurst. Uh, do we have any more public comment? Anyone else wishing to speak, please press the raise hand option on your screen. I see no more speakers, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Then we can move back to uh, committee member discussion. Does anybody have anything they'd like to add before we head towards a motion? Okay. Well, thank you, Chief Zamora, for the thorough presentation. And I really do appreciate the um, personal stories that we receive as a part of that. It, it, um, it gives us a better picture of, of what y'all do in our community. Thank you. Okay. Thank At this point, we would accept the motion uh, to accept 
the Watsonville Police Department status report for January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2021. So moved with gratitude to the police department. Thank you. I'll second it. All right, excellent. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion before we vote? Hearing none, let's take a roll call. Casillas? Yes. Dana? Yes. Lugoni? Yes. Gonzalez? Yes. Strum? Yes. Olson? Yes. Ragsack? Yes. Snodgrass? Yes. Wibbera? Yes. And McCosey? Yes. The motion carries. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Chief Zamora, and congratulations again on your uh, new position. All right, we will now move on to 5E, Parks and Community Services Department status report, July through December of 2021. Nick, take it away. And just so you know, uh, when he goes off screen, we're going to have a prize for anybody who can spell his name right on the first try. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that one. <laughs> Um, th thank you, Robbie, for the introduction. Again, my name is Nick Kalabaki, but I'm the Parks and Community Services Director for the City of Watsonville. Um, it's great to see everyone this, this afternoon, evening. Um, just a quick point of clarification. So, so my update and the report that was written for um, today's update runs from July to December of 21. I'm still kind of getting the, the groove and the rhythm of um, the reporting for this committee. Um, was under the impression that because our last report covered the first half of last year, this report should cover the second half. Um, so I apologize that um, the written report doesn't doesn't cover the first half of 21, but I'd be happy to um, to give a recap of what we talked about back in back in May. Um, and Erwin, I'm not sure if that if that affects any of the reporting requirements of this committee, but um, we can talk about that offline. So I apologize for that. Um, share my screen real quick here. Um, so again, I'm um, going to focus mainly on the second half of 21, um, but just as a recap for um, what happens in our departments in terms of Measure Y funds for the beginning half of 2021. Um, if, you, if you roll back, roll back the clock and recall um, the first half of the year, we were, we were still very much in the COVID um, pandemic and um, you know most of uh, our schools were still under remote learning um, and a lot of our programs were still kind of functioning under the guidelines of, of county health and um, and uh, the California state public health. And so uh, for the majority of last year, we ran distance learning pods um, instead of our regular programming at the youth center and our PAL locations and, and science workshop and so forth. And so we had groups of, of up to 12 young people um, with, with um, steady, um, staff members that were that were assigned to, the, to those groups that, that were running out of several locations uh, where we offered distance learning support throughout the school day and then transitioned into after school recreational programming in the afternoon. Um, so that's primarily what we use measure uh, measure Y funding for last year in terms of after school programming. Um, we, we partnered very closely with the school district as well and along with county parks. And um, a lot of the funding for those for those programs came through both of those other agencies as well. So there actually wasn't a whole lot of, of, of funding um, from Measure Y that actually was used to, to support the, those programs. Well, we did, but we did use a little bit. Um, as we transitioned out of the school year and into summer, um, as, as, as most of you may recall, um, when June 15th rolled around, a lot of those COVID restrictions were rolled back. Um, with the anticipation that normal school would, would begin in the fall. Um, a lot of our masking mandates went away as well. And, and, and you know, the world as, as we um, kind of know it today um, reopened up. And so it, it, was, it was kind of in June of, of 2021 when we started to be able to resume a lot of the programming that we had offered prior to the pandemic. Um, and so I'm happy to report that a lot of those programs um, have reopened and I'm gonna spend most of my, my time today in front of you um, speaking about, about um, the reopening of our, our programs. Um, but to finish talking about the first half of 21, um, because a lot of our youth programming wasn't in, in place and, and couldn't take place due to the restrictions um, from, the, from the pandemic, most of the, the money that we spent last fiscal year was used to help support um, our park operations and to continue to ensure that there was um, safe, available space for young people to, to spend outdoors. So we worked on a lot of playground repairs, 
um, some tennis court resurfacing and basketball court resurfacing. And um, it, it, was, it was mainly those activities where Measure Y funding was spent um, for that first half of the year. So rolling right into um, the second half, if I can get my slides to transition. One second here. Okay, here we go. All right, so for, for this current fiscal year, um, again, as, as Marissa mentioned, 8% um, of the pie comes to parks and community services. And um, for this fiscal year is originally estimated at um, about a little under $340,000. Um, and the funding that our department gets is, is really um, intended to support uh, youth prevention programs, um, parks and recreation services, and, and safe places for young people um, throughout our community, whether it be our recreation centers or our, our parks. Um, so our, our funding priorities for this, this current fiscal year um, really focus around two of our, our overall um, strategic goals of our department. Um, the first is prioritizing the core, and what that really speaks to is, is um, in terms of maintenance and and upkeep of our facilities and our parks, um, really prioritizing um, dealing with the, the approximately $20 million in deferred maintenance that we have across our system. Um, so it's, it's looking at fixing things like um, broken HVAC systems, leaky roofs, um, playground equipment that's no longer usable that needs to be enhanced and, and, and replaced. Um, you know, everything from replacing the backboards of our basketball courts to tennis court nets and um, everything else in between. And so um, that's, that's what goal number one is. Uh, goal number two has to do with impactful youth development programming. So this again kind of dives into the prevention side of, of what we do and how we play a role in public safety. Um, and there's, there's kind of two bullets underneath that. The first is to, is to offer free after school and summer youth development programs. Um, and, and, and most of the funding from Measure Y goes to support um, the programming at, um, that's based out of the June, June who I was Walter Rodriguez Youth Center. Although there is some crossover into um, now the two PAL sites along with our science workshop sites now that both of those programs are, are under uh, Parks and Community Services. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as I, I get through my presentation. Um, and then a, 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 a big piece of our, our programming under this area also um, involves youth case management services that we run um, out of several of our sites now, along with some enrichment programs that again, I'll talk about in just a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so as far as our, our, our parks and facilities, um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that we've got about $20 million in, in deferred maintenance needs. And so again, on, on the parks end, um, Measure Y funds are really used to, to help address those needs. And I, I gave some examples of, of what of the types of things that um, this funding helps helps with on the parks end. This year, um, some of the bigger projects that we're focusing on are uh, playground surfacing. So um, the picture here is of Callahan Park. You'll see that um, that the surfacing on this playground um, consists of uh, what we like to call engineered wood fibers, or as most people know, as wood chips or tan bark, like we used to call it back in the day. Um, and all that stuff needs to be replaced periodically at, at our parks to, to, to maintain safe and accessible surfaces. And so um, we spent a good chunk of our Measure Y funds this year to help replenish um, that surfacing throughout our park system. Um, as, as many of you know, also throughout the pandemic and, 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 and through today, really, our, our parks and playgrounds are getting used way more than they ever have as um, youth and families um, seek to find you know, kind of safe places outdoors um, to get out, of their, get out of their homes and get some fresh air and, and so forth. And so um, we've seen kind of some increased wear and tear on our, on our parks and facilities over the past couple of years through the pandemic. And um, you know, that kind of coupled with the deferred maintenance needs that were already in place before the pandemic, um, we're, we're playing a lot of catch up. And so the, the money that we get from Measure Y is, is helping tremendously in, in at least kind of keeping above board on um, the needs of our, our parks and playgrounds. Um, so the real exciting stuff though, because um, you know, I, I, I don't know, I, other than Eric, I'm not sure who else um, on, on this call tonight gets really excited about parks and, <laughs> and surfacing. Um, but uh, in terms of our youth development programs, um, like I mentioned before, all of our programs that were in place prior to the pandemic have pretty much opened up and um, are back up and running. So we're really, really excited about that. Um, back in June, we were able to 
to open um, all the facilities that you see on the slide um, that are listed here. So Pal Davis, Rodriguez, um, the Youth Center, um, which we've, we've now transitioned into, into kind of acting as our third uh, police activity league site. Um, so prior to the pandemic, we were, were actually working on, on, on that transition and putting plans into place to make that happen. Um, and then of course COVID hit and, and all of that kind of got, got side railed. But when we reopened that facility in June, um, we, we, we reopened it and rebranded it as, as a PAL um, center. So the programming that, that takes place there and the membership model that, that, that takes place at, um, at, at PAL Davis and PAL Rodriguez um, is, is pretty much mirrored at the youth center. Um, and so, so it really is intended to, to function just like our, our other um, successful PAL programs, and um, I think gives us greater opportunity to, to um, involve our, our wonderful police officers in programming, as well as, you know, kind of really hone in and focus on, on, on public safety and, and make sure that it's a safe place for young people. Um, so so that's, been, that's been great. Um, I think not unlike a lot of other youth programs throughout the community, um, we are slowly building up our attendance base. Um, you know, we, we've, we've got decent attendance today, but I think like most other youth programs throughout our community, attendance has, has been slow to come back um, with, with you know, kind of the ongoing fear of COVID and, and um, you know, the, the restrictions that continue to be out in the community. So um, attendance hasn't been bad necessarily, but it's definitely not at the levels that, that, that they were prior to the pandemic. And so um, we, we're, we're still trying to figure out how to, how to kind of break that barrier and, and, and um, get parents and participants to feel more comfortable to, to come out after school hours and participate in, in programs like these. Um, I mentioned the science workshop sites er earlier as well. Um, and and I, I mentioned them because um, also this summer, one of the changes that we made programmatically through um, kind of, kind of uh, with, with the budget cycle and, and across the city is that um, the science workshop that was previously under Public Works um, came under our department as well. And um, it's given us some great opportunities to take a look at how we better kind of just get all of our youth development programs in sync across the whole city from you know, the, the, the programs that we ran directly under Parks and Community Services previously, along with the Police Activity League and the science workshop, and has allowed us to, to, to really kind of pull resources together in a way that, that helps to provide or helps to create efficiencies in the way that we operate. Um, and I think a good example of that is, is that um, all of the, the teammates that work in these different programs all have the same title now. And so it gives us the ability to, to, to maximize people's strengths and interests and move them around to programs to, um, in, in ways that, that, that helps to meet those interests and those, and those talents. Um, it also gives us abil an ability to, to move people around you know, in, in a pinch, as, as we all know. COVID has, has wreaked havoc on being able to schedule people to keep um, all kinds of businesses open, um, including our, our services. And so when we run through cycles like that, where we, where we have you know, mass numbers of people that aren't able to come to work because of um, um, you know, positive cases or, or um, exposures, it allows us to, to kind of move our teammates around in ways to help make sure that programs are covered and that we can keep the doors open and, and keep things running as usual. Um, it, it also has given us the ability to take a look at the different types of programming that's offered at the science workshop and at our other programs and, and kind of meld those together. Um, so we're working on a plan now to figure out, you know, how do we expand science workshop programming into the other sites that, that, um, that we operate, um, you know, whether it be the youth center or Pal Davis and, and, and otherwise. Um, and, and then I think, I, I think that, that relationship or that partnership kind of works both ways as well. I think there's going to be good opportunities also to figure out you know, how do we bring the PAL model over to some of the other programs that, that haven't been a part of that so far? Um, not to say that we'll necessarily run the science workshop just like PAL, but it gives us the opportunity to say, hey, you know, um, it's great when officers participate in late night gym at the youth center. Like, what would it look like if we had officers that dropped into the science workshop and, and um, you know, built relationships with young people in, in that way? So um, we're looking at all those opportunities, and I think there's, there's a lot more to come um, as far as that goes. Beyond just, just kind of reopening our facilities and getting programming back to normal, I think the really exciting thing that, that, um, that has, has taken place and has started since the summer is um, our ability to expand um, programming into the, the evening hours and onto the, in, in, into the weekends as well. Um, 
So since uh, since June, we've added, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact number of hours offhand right now, but at least somewhere between five to 10 programming hours um, each week um, have been added to both the Powell Davis site and, and the Youth Center site. Um, before COVID, those sites were open until about 6, 6.30 uh, in the afternoons, just on Monday through Friday. Um, and they're both now open until about nine o'clock on Friday nights and also open most of the day and into the evening hours on Saturday. Um, so that's, that's expanded the, the opportunities that we have for young people to participate in, in programs, um, especially during those, those times that, that I think we, we all know, um, you know, tend to be the times that, that um, young people find not so positive things to do. And so, you know, the, the goal there is to, is to really offer things and, and keep youth engaged in programs that are positive, um, where they're around positive youth model, uh, where they're around positive role models and um, are engaged in activities that, that uh, we'd, we'd like to see them engaged in rather than kind of roaming, roaming the streets and doing whatever it is teenagers do when they're not supervised. Um, so that's, that's really the goal there. Um, Saturday nights and Friday nights, uh, we've, we've concentrated on making a schedule or creating a schedule of, of kind of special fun activities to keep young people engaged. So we've, we've had things like retro video game nights. Um, I, I mentioned kind of like late night basketball nights. Um, um, so so it's, it's really kind of things like that that, that, that we're working on to, to, to fill, those, um, fill those evenings and make sure young people have, have fun, exciting things to do. Um, along along that, that same line, um, one of the other programs that's come back online or is, is, is in the process of coming back online is our Youth Action Council. Um, and it, that, that program is a leadership group that um, was, was kind of just taking flight before the pandemic that we're working on rebuilding now. Um, that group is, is kind of charged with helping us to plan some of these late night activities also so that it's not just um, adults coming into a room to try to figure out what young people like to do. But, um, but you know, we're really working with, with youth and young people to, to have um, their input heard, but also um, you know, teach them leadership skills so that they're able to plan some of these things themselves for their peers. Um, so that's um, something that's, that's kind of in the works and um, be excited to talk more about come May when we come back together. Uh, a few of the, of the other programs that I wanted to highlight tonight. Um, I think back in May, we talked a little bit about our YES program, our, our Youth Enrichment Support Services program. Um, this is a partnership with PVPSA and um, they, they provide case management services for young people in our programs and really throughout the whole community that, that just need some additional support and, 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 um, and help. So this, um, this program is really intended to, to, to outreach and um, support youth and families that are kind of on the verge of, of um, you know, potentially um, offending or entering the system, but aren't quite there yet. So they're, they're kind of, you know, if you, if, if you use the grading system, they're kind of like your C students, right? Like they, they're, they're not doing terrible, but they, they're kind of um, um, at risk of, of, of becoming, um, you know, kind of on the, other, on the other end of things. So if you think about like, like how this, this program kind of um, is layered with Caminos, it's kind of like that layer underneath Caminos to try to reach those youth before they, they enter the system and, and then need greater support. Um, so we have a case manager that's on site at the youth center um, two days a week, and then is at the science workshop um, uh, a couple of days a week, and then kind of travels between Davis and, um, and Callahan Park, um, where we have another after school program. Um, and the, the, the case manager, you know, kind of works heavily at building relationships with the young people there, um, provides additional support and has office hours with both youth and families um, that, that is, is part of um, his caseload. Um, that uh, individual along with PVPSA also helps to provide our, our team with training on, on everything from, um, you know, kind of youth violence topics to, to how to deal with bullying and cyberbullying and um, is, is a great support to the rest of the team um, on our youth development side of things. Um, another super exciting partnership that we've been able to start thanks to Measure Y is our partnership with um, uh, Santa Cruz County Arts Council. And um, we've developed a, um, a contractual agreement with them where, where, where they have been able to send us a number of different instructors throughout the week. Um, so there's a picture um, on the screen here of, of, of one of those classes. Um, so we're running everything from, from music to um, several kinds of dance. We're offering folklorico and hip hop and, and, and Latin dance. Um, there's also some, some um, 
uh, visual arts classes that we're offering throughout the week as well. Everything from painting to kind of more, more, more kind of like arts and craft type, type classes. Um, but those are being offered both at the youth center and at, at um, the Davis site and um, have gone really, really well. And it's, it's been nice to be able to just um, have that, that kind of level of programming back in our, our buildings um, run by, by professional artists um, and, and exposing our young people to, to um, those types of things that, that as, as we all know, don't always get offered in, um, in the school day nowadays. Um, our, martial art, arts, our martial arts program um, that we've offered through PAL at the Rodriguez site is also back online, um, running several days a week. So we're running um, judo and self-defense along with karate. And um, it, it's been nice to see that program come back online as well. And I talked quite a bit about the science workshop already, so I, I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave that there. Um, and that brings me to the end of my presentation. So um, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Nick. Uh, it is exciting to, to see these programs coming back online. Um, and, uh, and, and good news, uh, as far as my agenda is concerned, you are only presenting on half a year. So you're all set. <laughs> That's what we'll, we need to vote on. So um, great. So uh, we'll take any questions or comments we have from the committee. Hey, <clears throat> good evening, Nick. And Robbie, I'm not even going to try and spell his last name, let alone pronounce it. So we're going to go with Nick. Kalamaki. <laughs> um, Nick, are there any plans for pickleball courts in the city? It's a popular game. It's taken the nation. It's good for seniors. Any, any plans for that? that My wife a... would second the question. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, and you know, what, what I've experienced with pickleball is that that request comes in waves because it's funny that, you know, I hadn't really heard that request much since I've been back with the city for the past four years, but in the past two weeks, I think you're probably the fifth person that's brought that up and asked that question. Um, so here we are. <laughs> um, so in our measure Y budget, we, we do have funding again this year to, to help with striping and resurfacing of, of tennis courts. Um, we, we've got all of our courts on a rotational basis. And um, what we're, we're working on now with our new sports supervisor is um, he, he comes to us, he, he just started back in the end of November. And um, he, before uh, he came to us, worked for the YMCA of the Central Coast um, and was contracted to operate the, the Salinas um, Tennis Center and um, has some great relationships with both um, pickleball instructors and tennis instructors. And so he started, um, he, he's starting to put together some pickleball programming that's gonna take place at Callahan Park. And um, what we're gonna do temporarily at, at least um, as, as those programs come online is put down some temporary lines for pickleball um, at those tennis courts and, and kind of see how things go and see how popular um, uh, both the classes are and how popular the courts are outside of, of those classes just for, for regular pickleball. So we'll lower the nets as well and, and, and make, it, make it usable for, for that sport um, kind of you know, whenever the courts are open. Uh, part of what we're trying to do too is, is figure out um, which of our courts across our system are, are the best location for, for pickleball, um, you know, if and when we, we make the permanent switch. Um, so Joey, our sports supervisor, is also doing some reconnaissance work and checking out all of our courts at different times of the day and, 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 um, and week to figure out, you know, which ones are, are probably least used um, and kind of marry that with, you know, where do we think most of our pickleball players live and come from? Um, we're kind of guessing that the ones that Joyce McKenzie might be a good a good bet for for, for this, um, but but again we're starting with Callahan first because we because we kind of know anecdotally that those courts are the least used um, for the time being. But um, yeah, there's definitely plans. We're looking at it. Excellent. <clears throat> and for those of you who don't know, Google pickleball. Uh, seniors can play it with grandchildren. It's a great family activity outdoors. Um, so anyway, enough of that. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, it is a fun game. All right, do we have any other questions or comments? Nick, uh, Brian Fulgoni from the police department. I just had a comment on the science workshops. And I think you said you're trying or thinking of ways to integrate the police department or officers into that program. Have you considered reaching out to our CSI team, the crime scene investigators, Ooh. to put on some type of uh, fingerprint class or some type of, of like a mold class? Um, that may be a way to uh, build that relationship there. 
That's a great idea. I love that. I'm going to um, send our supervisor out there an email after this. Thanks, well, I, I happen to be uh, in charge of the CSI team, so just email oh, me. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Excellent. See, we're even getting, getting progress on our next report. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to public input. Well, go ahead. Uh, thanks, thanks again, uh, Nick uh, Kalawaki. At, that's uh, C A L U B A Q U I B. And uh, we say good steward of the money. And I know that we've had uh, people come to our council meetings and saying, oh, we, that's not enough to really do anything. Well, $340,000 is not chicken feed. And uh, I just appreciate the good stewardship of that money and the great work that's being done. And so once again, kudos and commendations to staff and certainly um, the, the directors, the uh, commissioners and the public as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hurst. Uh, do we have any more public comment? I don't see any more, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we can move back to committee member discussion. Do we have any more discussion on Nick's report? Yes, Eric. I don't have a discussion on Nick's report, but maybe somebody could help me. We heard tonight from Nick that he gets 8% of the Measure Y money. And is that set in statute? I, I'd really like to get him double that. And if not, at least into the double digits, 10 or 11 or 12%. Um, how can we make that happen? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, folks, but I believe that is set because it was um, established by a vote of the public uh, okay. in an election. And so uh, theoretically, it could go back to be changed, but it would need to be changed by a, another measure. Got it. Uh, replacing Y, if, if I understand correctly, or a new measure of its own. But for now, I believe that is set. Nick, it's going to be 8%, but the love is there. <laughs> Appreciate that, Eric. Well, just, really, what we can do is get folks to spend their money in Watsonville, more tax dollars, that 8% is bigger. So folks watching at home, shop locally. Mr. Chair, um, yes. I have one more person that raised their hand for oh, to speak from the you. public, if you would indulge. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, the telephone number is starting in 510. Go ahead. Hi, this is Cindy Sirwin, um, finance director. Sorry for joining late, but I'm on the phone and joining late. And I actually just wanted to echo what was just stated, that yes, the measure and with the percentages was passed by voters. And so a change of that would also require uh, a vote by the voters. Great, thank you for the confirmation. Okay, so uh, do we have any more uh, committee member discussion? Hearing none, uh, we now will need a motion accepting staffing and operations report from the Parks and Community Services Department from July 1st through December 31st of 2021. Do we have a motion? I'll make the motion to accept the minutes. Thank you. And a second? Awesome. Great, thank you very much. Uh, if there's no further discussion, I think we can move to a roll call. Casillas? Yes. Dana? Yes. Fulgoni? Yes. Gonzalez? Yes. Strum? Yes. Olson? Yes. Ragsack? Yes. Snodgrass? Waverer? Yes. And McCosey? Yes. Okay, the motion carries. Okay, excellent. Uh, I believe that is the end of our agenda. So I will take one moment to say that. Uh, as a Watsonville boys basketball coach, Watsonville High School varsity boys are competing for a league championship this year, and senior night is on Friday night. So if you want to come see some good basketball, girls are playing at 5.30, boys are playing at 7. Uh, and with that, please go and continue to serve your community with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. And our meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you all. I appreciate Thanks you being here. Your time is important and we appreciate it. Good night, everyone. Good night.